27. The Bleeding Heart The patron brought him the letter in the morning. He burst into Bond's room, holding the envelope in front of him as if it was on fire. There has been a terrible accident! Madame, Bond hurled himself out of bed and through the bathroom, but the communicating door was locked. He dashed back and through his room and down the corridor past a shrieking, terrified maid. Vesper's door was open. The sunlight through the shutters lit up the room. Only her black hair showed above the sheet, and her body under the bedclothes was straight and molded like a stone effigy on a tomb. Bond fell on his knees beside her and drew back the sheet. She was asleep. She must be. Her eyes were closed. There was no change in the dear face. She was just as she would look, and yet, and she was so still. No movement, no pulse, no breath. That was it. There was no breath. Later, the patron came and touched him on the shoulder. He pointed at the empty glass on the table beside her. There were white dregs in the bottom of it. It stood beside her book and her cigarettes and matches, and the small, pathetic litter of her mirror and lipstick and handkerchief, and on the floor the empty bottle of sleeping pills, the pills Bond had seen in the bathroom that first evening. Bond rose to his feet and shook himself. The patron was holding out the letter towards him. He took it. "'Please notify the commissionaire,' said Bond. "'I will be in my room when he wants me.' He walked blindly away without a backward glance. He sat on the edge of his bed and gazed out of the window at the peaceful sea. Then he stared dully at the envelope. It was addressed simply in a large, round hand. Pour Louis. The thought passed through Bond's mind that she must have left orders to be called early, so that it would not be he who found her. He turned the envelope over. Not long ago it was her warm tongue which had sealed the flap. He gave a sudden shrug and opened it. It was not long. After the first few words he read it quickly the breath coming harshly through his nostrils. Then he threw it down on the bed as if it had been a scorpion. My darling James, the letter opened, I love you with all my heart, and while you read these words, I hope you will still love me, because now, with these words, this is the last moment that your love will last. So goodbye, my sweet love, while we still love each other. Goodbye, my darling. I am an agent of the MWD. Yes, I am a double agent for the Russians. I was taken on a year after the war, and I have worked for them ever since. I was in love with a Pole in the RAF. Until you, I still was. You can find out who he was. He had two DSOs, and after the war he was trained by M and dropped back into Poland. They caught him, and by torturing him they found out a lot, and also about me. They came after me and told me he could live if I would work for them. He knew nothing of this, but he was allowed to write me. The letter arrived on the 15th of each month. I found I couldn't stop. I couldn't bear the idea of a 15th coming round without his letter. It would mean that I had killed him. I tried to give them as little as possible. You must believe me about this. Then it came to you. I told them you had been given this job at Royale, what your cover was, and so on. That was why they knew about you before you arrived, and why they had time to put the microphones in. They suspected the chief, but they didn't know what your assignment was, except that it had something to do with him. That was all I told them. Then I was told not to stand behind you in the casino, and to see that neither Matisse nor Leiter did. That was why the gunman was nearly able to shoot you. Then I had to stage that kidnapping. You may have wondered why I was so quiet in the nightclub. They didn't hurt me because I was working for MWD. But when I found out what had been done to you, even though it was the chief who did it and he turned out to be a traitor, I decided I couldn't go on. By that time I had begun to fall in love with you. They wanted me to find out things from you while you were recovering, but I refused. I was controlled from Paris. I had to ring up an Invalides number twice a day. They threatened me and finally they withdrew my control, and I knew my lover in Poland would have to die. But they were afraid I would talk, I suppose, and I got a final warning that Smirsch would come for me if I didn't obey them. I took no notice. I was in love with you. Then I saw the man with the black patch and the splendide, and I found he had been making inquiries about my movements. This was the day before we came down here. I hoped I could shake him off. I decided we would have an affair, and I would escape to South America from Le Havre. I hoped it would, I would have a baby of yours, and be able to start again somewhere. But they followed us. You can't get away from them. I knew it would be the end of our love if I told you. I realized that I could either wait and be killed by Smirsch, and perhaps get you killed too, or I could kill myself. There it is, my darling love. You can't stop me calling you that, or saying that I love you. I am taking that with me, and the memories of you. I can't tell you much to help you. The Paris number was Invalides 55200. I never met any of them in London. Everything was done through an accommodation address, a newsagent's at 450 Charing Cross Place. At our first dinner together, you talked about that man in Yugoslavia who was found guilty of treason. He said, I was carried away by the gale of the world. That's my only excuse. That and for the love of the man whose life I tried to save. It's late now and I'm tired, and you're just through two doors, but I've got to be brave. You might save my life, but I couldn't bear the look in your dear eyes. My love, my love, V. Bond threw the letter down. Mechanically, he brushed his fingers together. Suddenly, he banged his temples with his fists and stood up. 
For a moment he looked out towards the quiet sea, then he cursed aloud, one harsh obscenity. His eyes were wet, and he dried them. He pulled on a shirt and trousers, and with a set cold face he walked down and shut himself in the telephone booth. While he was getting through to London, he calmly reviewed the facts of Vesper's letter. They all fitted. The little shadows and question marks of the past four weeks, which his instincts had noted, but his mind had rejected, all stood out now like signposts. He saw her now only as a spy. Their love and his grief were relegated to the box room of his mind. Later, perhaps, they would be dragged out, dispassionately examined, and then bitterly thrust back with the other sentimental baggage he would rather forget. Now he could only think of her treachery to the service and to her country and of the damage it had done. His professional mind was completely absorbed with the consequences, the covers which must have been blown over the years, the codes which the enemy must have broken, the secrets which must have been leaked from the center of the very section devoted to penetrating the Soviet Union. It was ghastly. God knew the mess would be cleared up. He ground his teeth. Suddenly Matisse's words came back to him. There are plenty of really black targets around. And earlier, what about Smirsch? I don't like the idea of these chaps running around France killing anyone they feel has been a traitor to their precious political system. How soon Matisse had been proved right, and how soon his own little sophistries had been exploded in his face. While he, Bond, had been playing Red Indians through the years, yes, Le Chiffre's description was perfectly accurate, the real enemy had been working quietly, coldly, without heroics, right there at his elbow. He suddenly had a vision of Vesper walking down a corridor with documents in her hand on a tray. They got it on a tray, while the cool secret agent with a double O number was gallivanting around the world, playing Red Indians. His fingernails dug into the palms of his hand, and his body sweated with shame. Well, it was not too late. Here was a target for him, right to hand. He would take on Smirsch and hunt it down. Without Smirsch, without the cold weapon of death and revenge, the MWD would be just another bunch of civil servant spies, no better and no worse than any of the Western services. Smirsch was the spur. Be faithful, spy well, or you die. Inevitably and without any question, you will be hunted down and killed. It was the same with the whole Russian machine. Fear was the impulse. For them it was always safer to advance than to retreat. Advance against the enemy and the bullet might miss you. Retreat, evade, betray, and the bullet would never miss. But now, he would attack the arm that held the whip and the gun. The business of espionage could be left to the white-collar boys. They could spy and catch the spies. He would go after the threat behind the spies. The threat that made them spy. The telephone rang and Bond snatched up to the receiver. He was on to The Link, the outside liaison officer who was the only man in London that he might telephone from abroad, then only in dire necessity. This is 007 speaking, and this is an open line. It's an emergency, can you hear me? Pass this on at once. 3030 was a double, working for Redland. Yes, damn it, I said was. The bitch is dead now.